The Palestinian arena over the past year was characterized by growing violence and the radicalization of a discourse on both sides. Uh, they avoided decision making, and this uh, led to a background to escalation. Abbas's status has weakened, and the internal fights over inheritance are warming things up. Hamas is gaining further strength in the Gaza Street and in Jerusalem in general, and specifically the Temple Mount are a source of friction. And the survey of the Institute shows that the Israeli population perceives this conflict as the most serious threat on Israel today, probably uh, because of the large number of victims of uh, the terror wave in this past year. And we've also seen that there is a growing uh, diminishing of public support for a two-state solution over the past decade. But when Israelis were asked what's the best option for resolving the conflict, the majority said either to separate or strive to a comprehensive agreement, which means a two-state solution. This is in line the data with the fears of uh, the Israelis of a reality of a binational state. Most Israelis say that they fear such a situation because of the fear of increased violence between Jews and Arabs, and also because they fear the Jewish character. They fear for the Jewish character of the state of Israel. I'd like to invite Noah Schusterman, a researcher at the INSS. Noah, please. Hello, everyone. Good afternoon. My name is Noah Schusterman, and I am a researcher in the INSS. And before we begin, I wanted to tell you about a project of ours and perhaps to invite you to participate the demonstration some of you already participated in during the break. A year ago in our research program, we initiated an innovative project uh, for the Palestinian arena. And uh, the purpose of that was to help decision makers examine the implications of decisions or events that uh, happen. And this is an adapted version of um, crowdsourcing, and we're doing, going to do it interactively. And for those who still haven't done it on your own during the bre break, or the next few minutes, we'll do it together. I will present a scenario, and you will rate its impact on three parameters. Uh, will it increase escalation or not? Will it bring the collapse of the Palestinian Authority closer uh, or sooner? closer or farther away, the ranking is on a scale between plus three to minus three, plus three brings it closer, minus three distances it at zero, means that the parameter isn't affected by the event. For example, if in a security situation scenario, I think it has no impact on a one state solution, then I'll give it a zero. If I think it means that it distances from one state, then I'll give it minus one, minus two, or minus three, whatever I choose. In order to participate, if you haven't done it yet, please pull out your cell phone, scan the QR code on the screen, and uh, to log into the website and put in the code. After we're going to go over the three scenarios together and we'll write the going to have the session moderated by Brigadier General Reserves Udi Dekel, head of the Palestinian Arena Program at INSS. And the participants will be uh, Gadi Eisenkot and Danny Danun. Let's begin. First scenario, Defensive Shield 2. Operation Defensive Shield 2. Since March 2022, we have more and more terror acts from Judea and Samaria that have taken the lives of dozens of Israelis despite the attempts of the ISA and the IDF to address uh, these uh, uh, terrorists. Specifically, Cabinet has decided to go launch an all-out campaign, Defensive Shield 2, that includes uh, the entrance of uh, soldiers to Palestinian population centers. How can this uh, scenario impact the parameters going towards a one-state solution, a security escalation, and the collapse of the Palestinian authority. Let's move on to the next scenario. As part of the attempts to improve the economic situation among Palestinians, the Israeli government decides to add 20,000 work permits to Palestinians in Israel with an emphasis on work permits for high tech. These employees will earn four times the average salaries in the PA and two times the average salary of a high tech employee who works within the PA. Once again, I invite you to rate this. How will this impact uh, deteriorating or moving on to a one state solution? How does it affect the collapse of the PA. 
and how does it affect a security escalation? And let's move on to the last scenario. The Israeli government uh, will pass the law of canceling the disengagement in northern Samaria. The next morning, 20 settlers will go with trailers uh, to the uh, territory where Sanur used to be. And uh, they declare that uh, they, this is a new uh, a settlement or renewed one, and they want to resettle two other previous settlements. Please rank how this affects the parameters of escalate of uh, going towards uh, one uh, state uh, situation, a uh, security escalation, or the collapse of the PA. Does it bring it closer or doesn't affect it or it pushes it further back? So let's give you just a few more seconds. Thank you for your cooperation. Those of you who participated in the survey will show you the results later during this session. I hope you've all finished answering. Maybe uh, you already finished. And now I'd like to invite Brigadier General in Rezuz Udi Dekel, along with former Chief of General Staff and MK Gadi Eisenkot, and former Israeli to Ambassador to the UN and member of Knesset, Danny Danone. Thank you very much. Well, this is a session we can call it Udi's Friends. By the way, the two most senior political uh, figures who agreed to come to our conference and uh, didn't uh, stop themselves or prevent themselves from coming. So I'd like to begin with you, Danny. I'd like to ask you, over the past 15 years, there was a pretty clear Israeli strategy in the Palestinian arena, which defined it as an official arena that said we need to achieve as uh, many uh, long periods of security, uh, calm uh, periods as long as possible. And, you know, the politicians would always say to the military, you need to buy us time until we can reach decisions regarding the future of this arena. It seems to us that something has changed in the policy of the new government. Is there any a meaningful discussion regarding the up-to-date strategy or policy, or is it all things that we simply see and we see how things unfold uh, on the ground? Hello, everyone. Uh, good afternoon. I'm very happy to be here. It wasn't easy to come here with all the protests and the Knesset, and let's respect those who also are here to express their opinion. I think that we can see that on the Palestinian security issue, there aren't any major differences between the governments. This approach of managing uh, conflict management. It could be Prime Minister A, B, or C. Ultimately, because we don't have a partner on the Palestinian side who can actually negotiate, who's interested in negotiating, then the political uh, echelon ultimately manages uh, the uh, conflict and uh, tries to minimize any harm to the Palestinian population and to target as many terrorists as possible. As for the harm, as a member of a coalition, I have some criticism on uh, this government. I think we should have uh, responded differently uh, to the previous series of events and uh, not to go for containment, but decisive victory. A terrorist who murdered uh, that American-Israeli citizen who is now being buried, buried in Ranana. I would expect to uh, put a uh, Jericho under 100% absolute siege, not partial siege, and uh, we should go in and make arrests and to exert pressure, not just for the result, but also for the optics. But that's not the situation today. Even though this is a right-wing government, we still haven't opted for decisive victory. So there definitely you can see similarity between the different governments regarding the pa policy towards Palestinians. Let's wait, see maybe their uh, leadership will change, and then we'll see something else. I'd like to challenge you, Gabi. I haven't challenge Danny, but I will do so later. As somebody looking at things from the sidelines, we can see that certain elements in the government are trying to seize this opportunity in order to annex a territory C to uh, push the Palestinians away. And this is actually a new strategy. Well, reality, the reality in the past decade, decade and a half of the absence of a clear policy in the Palestinian arena, arena and conflict management or conflict minimization in which the security uh, establishment tries uh, to give some peace and quiet so that the politicians can decide. This has led to a situation which I think is a tragedy, a tragedy in which we see approximately 40% on the Palestinian side who support uh, 
a one-state solution. And here we have parties like Otsma Yudit and Tsionud Datit. These are two parties with 14 mandates who support the one-state vision. And I believe this reality is an Israeli uh, tragedy in which a minority uh, actually shares the Palestinian worldview and is leading us to a situation of a binational state or one uh, state. And uh, it's a terrible disaster for the Zionist endeavor. You don't need to be uh, too sophisticated to understand that. And this la be is because of the absence not of political decisions, but not of uh, military decisions, but political decisions regarding regarding the future of this conflict. There's no argument about this murderous terrorism that we've dealt with since the establishment of the State of Israel and even before it was established, and we're going to have to continue to deal with it for many years. The question is, what kind of a country do we want? And right now, the uh, approach seems to be leaning towards a binational state or a one-state solution, and this is bad news for Israel unless a historic uh, decision uh, will be taken uh, uh, at the scale of Ben-Gurion uh, regarding what kind of country do we want to see here 20, 30, 40, 50 years from today, and for that reason, certain elements in the field in Judea and Samaria and certain parties are using this reality in order to promote an interest that perhaps, you know, uh, expresses the will of only 10 or 15 percent of Israelis. Danny, you represented us in the international, in the main international uh, platform. And the thing is that these are territories that are disputed and we are holding on to them until the conditions uh, will mature to reach a decision regarding their future. Uh, this is a belligerent uh, occupation according to international law. People don't like the word occupation, but according to occupation laws. And now the actions we're um, taking actually emphasize our permanent uh, regular hold on this ter is territory. Isn't this a change, a major change in the government's policy? Look, I don't think that I can use the same words you can. And I was very strict in the UN on the narrative. When they said occupation, I disagreed with them and I disagree with your terminology. The new Israeli government, maybe it's an unpopular opinion in this room, needs to change a policy. One of the laws I want to promote in this Knesset is to apply sovereignty in the Jordan Valley. I don't think that there's one reason and Menachem uh, Begin, who uh, applied sovereignty on the Golan Heights, if back then in the 1980s he would have simply added the words and in the Jordan Valley. And most Israelis, by the way, think that it's a uh, part of Israel, just like the Golan Heights, where we do have sovereignty. So I think we do need to apply our sovereignty in the Jordan Valley first, because it's in line with uh, our security concept and our rights on the ground. But as for Judea and Samaria, I don't see any uh, measure towards annexation, as you called it. I can tell you what I believe in, and I'm now representing myself, not the Likud and not the government. Our view should be that we want control uh, of the Palestinian Authority. That's the minimum and the maximum is to guarantee the security of Jewish settlers in Judea and Samaria. That's the strategy. Once we have a partner who will sit in a room with us and negotiate with us as somebody sent by a certain uh, population sector as an attorney, I'll try to get as much as I can for my client to supply maximum uh, security so that the Jewish settlers in Judea and Samaria can uh, live well with maximum control over the ground. So excuse me for interrupting you what Gabi just commented or warned us from uh, this trend that we are uh, moving into sliding into a binational state. It won't be a binational state. It will be a country with Jewish supremacy. No, no, not at all. Not Jewish supremacy. That's incorrect. And, you know, I think that the way you ask questions uh, is very, you know, uh, geared toward a specific outcome. I don't think any one Likud uh, member talks about one state for Jews and Palestinians. But in the left, you keep presenting this as a threat. If you don't do what needs to be done right now, that's what's going to happen. There's no discussion of that, though, even if we're talking about a binational state, the talk, the dialogue will ultimately be str about strategic issues of security, where we're located when I was deputy secretary of defense and Gadibi was deputy general, uh, chief of general staff with observers in the uh, Bika. Uh, 
we didn't agree to that. My interest is that we will decide in as many places as possible that will strengthen Jewish settlement and not to control the Palestinian population. So this talk of supremacy in the UN, they called it apartheid. It's simply incorrect. We're not there. Okay, Gadi, uh, picking up on what Danny just brought up, you know, there's this constant discussion uh, regarding the future of the Palestinian Authority, especially when people talk about the day after Abbas and people say, anyhow, this Palestinian Authority is, you know, uh, uh, insolvent, it's uh, crumbling down, it's not, it's dysfunctional. So what is the role of the PA in our relationship with the Palestinians? The Palestinian Authority is a weak authority with partial control. We shouldn't be uh, too uh, in awe of our capabilities, uh, but there are collaborations. What truly concerns me is to understand fully the worldview of our finance minister, Bezalel Smotrich. Anybody who wishes to understand uh, the worldview of perhaps the most influential party in the government perhaps could go into a program that's called the Decisive Victory uh, Plan. He wrote it. He signed off on it five or seven years ago, and uh, he presents uh, uh, several stages. And, and when I read it a few years ago, it seemed completely delusional. But when I see what's been happening in the Israeli government in the past two months, there's a great room for concern. Because in his plan, he writes, and you can look it up on Google, he says that the first stage is to take over the civil administration, to break it apart, to turn it into something civilian. The second uh, step is to uh, break apart the Palestinian Authority. The third third one is to initiate a decisive strike against Palestinian terror to try and uh, lead uh, the population to decide to leave this country. And anybody who stays here will receive Israeli citizenship and will uh, be recruited to the IDF. It's a messianic view. I see some of you in the audience are laughing, but you can look it up on Google. And that's the plan. That's the program of the most influential party in the coalition. Excuse me for challenging you, Danny, but you were uh, under secretary of defense as well. All these processes of this split of the civil administration, the fact that there are two many ministers heading it and what Gatti just described here this has created it a certain chaos on the ground and perhaps this was this chaos was manifest in the riots in Hawara this week how do can you uh, create a rationale of command and control and maintain stability and security on the ground look I don't like the fact that there are two ministers in one office period of definitely not in such an important ministry like the Ministry of Defense it's not the first time you used to have a home front command ministry it's definitely can lead to problems and ultimately we should say that those who nav the person who navigates the ship for better or worse is the prime minister and the cabinet there are ministers in uh, the government and I am often interviewed in uh, international channels and my wife asks me you have nothing better to you come at midnight and then you start giving interviews Look, ultimately, there are cabinet resolutions, government decisions. You need uh, to examine us based on government decisions and don't keep coming to us just like my dear colleague Eisenkot, member of Knesset, said the Minister of Finance said X, Ben Gvir said Y. If all I uh, do today is explain uh, uh, Ben Gvir and Smotrich, then I won't have time for anything else. What we need to do, we need to look at uh, the government's policy, the cabinet's policy, and I think that the Prime Minister knows he has the security experience to navigate this responsibly and you believe that he has his hands on the wheel as he defines on the security uh, issues yes we've seen the disagreements in the recent week and I asked him to convene the cabinet after the uh, series of terror attacks to bring people together and to contend with these things it's not easy for him to deal with some of the participants in the cabinet but ultimately it's the prime minister's uh, responsibility okay Noah why don't you come here and present uh, the uh, results uh, of the survey, what the people decided here on the three scenarios. Udi, with your permission, very, very briefly, because this is an important issue. I'm talking about the government's decisions and acts. The government or the cabinet decided to split up the civil administration and uh, for the border police units in Judea and Samaria will be subordinated to the Homeland Security Minister. That was a government decision. I said this. People asked if I were kidding, but I'm serious. Instead of 
giving the civil administration to Smotrich, it's better to give him the Israel Aerospace Agency. The less damage will be caused. This has always been navigated by the Prime Minister, and now we can see the result of this chaos in Judea and Samaria, and it's merely the beginning, and I can wish the Minister of Defense to... He needs to stand firm and insist on the unity of command and authority. Otherwise, it's all going to go to a very bad place. Okay, Danny, I know that I need to give you a chance, but... Okay. So I'd like to thank to uh, all those who cooperated with us. Over 200 people voted. Now let's see the results. Okay, very nice. So indeed, in the first scenario, which is the security one, we see that there's zero impact on uh, moving on to uh, one state reality, even though we have a pretty wide dispersion of results, even though most people gave it a one. A light impact towards security escalation, uh, 1.2, and the, an impact of 0 0.9. That's a slight impact towards uh, the collapse of the Palestinian Authority. That's in the case of uh, the uh, Operation Defensive Shield 2 scenario. So that's a relatively minimal impact. But you need to see that most answers are uh, lean towards more brings it closer, uh, both with respect to the security escalation. I think it doesn't makes sense that there's a security escalation uh, like Intifada. Okay, let's move on to the next scenario. Increasing the number of work permits for Palestinians, a relatively minimal impact on a um, moving on to a reality of a once a one state reality and a security escalation. There is a relatively significant impact one point minus 1.9, it distances from security escalation significantly and or also pushes further the collapse of the Palestinian Authority by minus 1.7. So a relatively a lot of people said that it was pushes further from the uh, security escalation and the collapse of the PA. In the last scenario of uh, repealing the disengagement law, here we can see that uh, sliding to a reality of uh, one state reality, people say, that it does push us closer to this reality, but ultimately the result was one. So there is a movement, but not a very strong one. And it also further brings closer to security escalation of 1.6. And regarding the collapse of the Palestinian Authority, 0 0.5, that means a minimal impact on uh, bringing closer the collapse of the PA of the repealing of uh, the uh, disengagement law. Thank you for that. No, we saw what the people thought, and we saw that the issue of sliding into a one-state reality, it's not that uh, strongly apparent in our mindset. Uh, and from our polls, we learned that 15% of Israelis support one state, 10% support uh, one uh, state without full uh, equal rights to the Palestinians, and 5% uh, of one country with all of its citizens equal and we don't support any of that the people in the panel here i think but let's get back to you uh, danny because another issue that came up and it has to do with the repealing of the disengagement law in northern samaria and the impact it might have on the pa i didn't ask you this do we want a strong and functioning palestinian authority or do we want it to break apart first of all we have to prepare and the Institute does a very good job in that and what's happening, what will happen on the day following. It will happen. Abu Mazen is an old man and he has poor health and at some point he will die and there will be the day next. There will be a question of gangs. Whoever which gang has more soldiers and weapons will be the, the kings. It could be one, it could be two, it could be three. That's what's going to happen de facto. So that's a challenge. Obviously, we as a sovereign country, it's easier for us to deal with one factor. Even if it's a problematic factor, it's one to deal with. Uh, in parallel, what happened to Syria in the past, there was a very problematic uh, leader in Syria, but at least there was an, uh, someone to turn to. There was one uh, uh, factor to speak to. We have to talk about what happens the day following Abu Mazen's death, because it will happen. I'm very pessimistic about that. And some, I know some of the players themselves, even though some of them are maybe logical players, but in order to establish their authority, leadership in Arab society and in international society, they decided to go in a bad direction, bad for us. So that's a challenge. 
after that, maybe we'll be able to develop the mechanisms and discussions and negotiation. Maybe you'll be surprised. Maybe we'll there will even be peace agreements. I mean, we did it with Egypt. We did it in Bahrain. Maybe there'll be a peace agreement. But that same leader that will rise in Palestine at first time will be adversarial and problematic for us, and that will be a, t a testing period. Gabi, a question for you. We're sitting here. There's a series of events here that have are, are unfolding and are escalating. What's the thing that you're most concerned with? I mean, looking at the following challenges uh, with the Palestinians. First of all, if I may, uh, for those for those who voted, what does it mean pu pushing to a one-state uh, uh, model? Look at the people in East Jerusalem where there's 380,000 Palestinians that got residency rights. They have a blue ID card, just like, but they can't vote. And look at the neglection, their crime rates, and look at the fact that people in East Jerusalem and most of the terrorist attacks that uh, happen by East Jerusalem, it's even intifada by children, by 13 and 14 year old boys. Imagine it's gonna be so much worse I I I and it's gonna spread. But the thing that I'm most concerned with and I've always been concerned with, I said that Israel of course faces great super threats, Iran, Palestinians, the North, but there's one big major challenge and that is to continue to establish ourselves as a, co a country with cohesion, Jewish and democratic, that works according to its Declaration of Independence. And the thing I am very worried about is this profound rift in Israeli society that manifests in ways that I haven't seen previously. So I've been working uh, with the Palestinian conflict for d over 30 years. We've always had terrorism. We've always had uh, this conflict but we were always determined and persistent and managed to fight off and ward terrorism. That's something we knew, but something that we saw in Duma, this criminality of, uh, that's, getting, that's becoming legitimized, at least partially, by authoritative figures, that is very concerning. I, you know, violence that is left unchecked by the Israeli government, and I can tell you that as chief of general staff, I went to Duma the day next, after the murder of uh, the Tawabshe family, a one-and-a-half-year-old baby and his parents. And two days ago, that was an event that was so extreme and must be a, a rebuked and must be addressed with an arm of steel. People like this must be investigated and must be brought to trial and must be brought to justice or we will lose all control of reality. And again, I reiterate, I start with the fact that there was terrorism always. We've had terrorist attacks and we have a serious enemy in the Palestinians, sure. And I, they were my enemy as a man of the military for 30 years. But what we see in Israeli society, that's what worries me. Danny, do you... Gadi uh, talked about something that, about an issue, and we also dealt in this conference. I mean, we first of all dealt a lot with Iran. We talked about uh, uh, domestic issues. How do you create, you know, societal cohesion in Israel? Now let's talk about the Palestinian society. Do you see the connection between these three factors and what we need to address in order to face these challenges uh, better? I certainly do see a connection. I think one of the, um, the few people who has uh, contributed to an internal discourse, uh, you know, uh, throughout the years consistently, because I was abroad and I fought our enemies, and I we know how to fight well abong amongst ourselves. But our enemies don't care left wing, right wing. They don't understand our reforms. Our enemies are targeting us and they don't care about our internal political strife. So I'm very concerned with this rift and um, I see how and uh, to believe how we can come out of it together, unified. I mean, we've gone through other crises, the, you know, 17 years ago in Gush Katif and other areas and other f historical examples. We managed to get over crises. So whether it's the Palestinians or not, we have to look at the shifts within our the rifts within ourselves, uh, and we also I talked with people in the lobby that are so concerned. I understand the concerns, but I am an, I believe that we can overcome what's happening. We can be able to find a way to move on as one society. You mean that we'll be able to find a way to talk amongst ourselves? Yes, 
I believe that we can find a domestic resolution. Not everybody will be happy, but maybe everybody will be equally unhappily and move forward and understand that our enemies will continue to undermine us, whatever our internal problems are. Uh, then we are about to start Ramadan very soon. That's going to be a challenge in and of itself. I'd like to thank you. We are the sovereign here in the state. We are the public, and you are our representatives that are there to uh, defend Israel, that it remains a democratic uh, Jewish state and prosperous as well. So we give you the strength and support to continue to fight for us and our future. Thank you. Thank you to Knesset members uh, Eisenkot and Danone, and now I have the 